Okay, so um, today we're going to do a problem on code forces called optimal subsequences. So a brief rundown of the problem if you haven't read it. So you're given a sequence of integers and they define um, an optimal subsequence of length k as the lexicographically least subsequence such that um, the sum of the k elements is maximum. Right? So, for example, if I had this first subsequence here, oh, can you guys see my cursor? Yeah? Okay, cool. Um, so, this, this, um, let's say we were doing this subsequence and k equaled 3. Alright, so if k equals 3, then obviously we want to pick 8, 7, and 6, um, and that will be our optimal subsequence because the, the sum of these three numbers is maximum, right? Now, it keeps going. It says that um, we're given a bunch of queries, and the queries are of the form k and pos. So essentially, it's asking, in this sequence, in an optimal subsequence of length kj, what is the posj element in that subsequence? Okay, so for example, if k equals 3, and we're like, um, what is the second element in the subsequence? It would be 7. I think in this sample case, yep, this sample case here, um, oh, we won't talk about it, it's just a small sample case. So, uh, let's look at bounds. So n and m, which are the length of the array and the number of queries, they're all 2 times 10 to the 5, which means we have to do this in log n time per query. So what we could do is we can first consider this first this first sequence here. So in this sequence, all of the elements are unique. And why is that important? Well, when all the elements are unique, there only exists a single optimal subsequence for each for each k. Well, why? Because obviously for an optimal subsequence of length k, you have to pick the k biggest um, numbers in the sequence. Now, if there were multiple elements, there would be multiple such subsequences. For example, if k equals 3 here, you could pick 5, 4, 3, or you could pick 5, 4, 3, right? And the lexicographically least would be this one. All right, so the first question is, um, how do we build this optimal subsequence? Like, is there a way to construct this optimal subsequence? And, um, well, first of all, you have to obey the lexicographically least option, right? The, the lexicographically least constraint. So, let's suppose that, first of all, all the elements are unique. To build an optimal subsequence of length k, you just pick the biggest number, then the next biggest number, then the next biggest number, and so on. So, you could literally sort it and then, like, do each one um, in order and time in total for each k. But the the question comes on the unique elements case where how do we how do we find the lexicographically least optimal subsequence? Well, it turns out that for example, if k equals three, you want to pick the okay, so let's say you have two threes here and you have to pick one of these two threes. Well you want to always want to pick the threes that are closer to the left end of this array because, um, well, if you picked one the right end, you can easily swap one of the, like this right one with this left one and you'd end up with a better sequence. So, what we can do is that we can um, do this array and then possibly, um, here's one way to do it. So you create a priority queue, right, where the elements are the value Oh, geez. Where it is sorted, um, it is sorted in descending order by value, and then ascending order by index. This would give us an ordering that um, constructs the optimal subsequence of length k for each k. Right? Is everyone kind of by that? Okay, so I'll check the chat. Yep. All right. Everyone seems good. Cool. So, raising my text. 
So once we have this, oh, I'll put PQ here just to remind, um, just to remind ourselves. So what we can do here is that um, once we have our optimal subsequence of length k, how do we find you know the the pos element in this subsequence? Well, here's one thing we could do. Let's suppose that you already had the subsequence, right? Let's suppose you already found the subsequence. For example, if k equaled um, if k equaled five, then it would be this sequence here. So let's suppose you found this subsequence. Let's mark any element that's not part of the subsequence as zero, and ele any element that is part of the subsequence as one. So you get this. Now let's suppose we want to find the fourth element in this subsequence. Well, what we can do is we can use our good friend segment tree here and construct a segment tree over this kind of array here. So what would that look like? Okay, zero plus one is one. Oh, it's a it's a it's a sum seg tree. So um, every element, every node stores the range sum. One plus one is two. 0 plus 0 is 0, 1 plus 1 is 2, 3, 2, 5. Okay, so now we have this segment tree, but what can this segment tree do for us? Well, if you notice, in this segment tree, oh, it's a bit upside down, but um, hopefully you guys won't mind. In this segment tree, oh, hang on, I'll just check chat. It's maybe a question. What if it's odd numbered? Uh, well, it's it's a segment tree, right? So you can just like if it, if it's odd numbered, you can just add zeros to the end. It will be fine um, until it's a power of two or an even number or what have you. So um, yeah, many could argue this segment tree is the right side up, but um, yeah. <laughs> so let's suppose we're trying to find the fourth element. Okay, so we start at the root and we try and walk the tree. Walking the tree is a very powerful technique if you haven't realized by now. Um, we're, at, we're at this range and we see five. Well, obviously, um, obviously our fourth element can't be outside of this range, right? So we go left to three. Okay, that means there's three elements here. And remember, we're trying to find the fourth element, which means that it can't be in these first three elements here. So we have to go this way and then subtract three from it. So now we're trying to find the first element in kind of this subarray range. All right, so we go left, we see a zero. And so that means that it contains zero elements here. So we don't have to look here and we go right and then we subtract zero. So currently our, um, our running total is one. We see a two here. We know it must be um, here, right? Then we go left, we see a one, and that's exactly the number of elements we want. So um, the fourth element is um, this little three here. And now how much time does this take? Well, each layer, you're doing a constant number of operations. You're just checking your left child and then going down your right child or going down your left child. And um, a segment tree obviously has log n layers, so this in turn takes order log n time, right, to um, walk down the tree. All right, is everyone so far? Okay, cool. Now, what we can do is, well, this is good and all, but like, we want to figure out how to do it for like, do it for all sequences, like all sequences from one to k, because it's a it's a querying problem, right? And um, if you didn't, uh, we were aim we're aiming for online query here, but like if you didn't worry about online, then what you can do is you can in fact sort the queries by value of k, and then just like every time k increases, you're just adding an extra element. Um, you just setting an extra element in this segment tree to one, right? So like, if I increase k by one, this would be one now. If I increase k by one, this would be one now, and then so on. Which means that 
we can in fact sort all the queries um, we can in fact sort all the queries by their k value and slowly add elements to our segment tree until all the elements have been added. Right, so we can just continually increment the value of k and solve for any queries of that k and continue on. But we're looking for online, not offline. Right, so any questions? We are good here? Yep, yep, okay, cool. So, now what we can do is that if ever you see a segment tree problem and you have an offline solution, a simple way to turn it into an online solution is to use a persistent segment tree. Um, and what is a persistent segment tree? Well, a persistent segment tree is just a segment tree that, that lets you look into its history. For example, if you do like k operations to it, it will also allow you to access um, its state after the second operation and the third operation and the 25th operation and so on. So it's like, it's like a segment tree, but you can roll back history at any time. So, how do we build a persistent segment tree? Well, it's actually rather simple once you know how to build a regular segment tree. So let's suppose we have our regular segment tree here. Oh boy. I'm using a mouse. My drawing can't be that bad, right? Alright, so now we have this, now we have this kind of segment tree thing. So, let's suppose we want to add another, oh, hang on, let me just set all these to zero, because all segment trees start at zero, obviously, for obvious reasons, because zero is the best number in the world. Okay, so, now, let's try and add, let's suppose we want to add an element at this index here. Well, what we would do is we would create a new root node that's kind of floating in the air and mark it as um, the first operation, right? So you kind of keep track, okay, so this is the zeroth operation, this is the second tree before any operations, this is the first, this is the second, and so forth. All right, so we have this node here and we're first going to recurse downwards towards our target, always creating a new node. Once we're at our target, we read the value that was previously in this node, which is a zero right now, and then we set it to a one. We increment it, right? Which is what we want to do. So now, we finish the recursion and we move back up. Okay, and then this segment tree wants to find the sum of its left child and its right child. Well, okay, its left child is obviously one, but what's its right child? Well, we haven't done anything to the right child, have we? So we can just connect to the previous right child in the tree here. And then we can go 1 plus 0 is 1. And then we move back up, we go to this node, and we, we think, okay, what's the sum of our left child and our right child? So we haven't done anything to the left child, so we can just connect to the previous one. And our right child is here, so 0 plus 1 is 1. Now, Let's add, let's say we want to add 2 to this element here. We create another node and mark it as the second, um, the second seg operation. We recurse downwards, always creating new nodes until we reach the node we want to reach. Then we add 2 to this and we go back up. Okay, so we look at this node and we see that, well, nothing has happened to its left child, so we can just connect to this one. 0 plus 2 is 2. And then we go up, oh, that's a 2. Then we go up to this node, and then we see that, okay, this node, we haven't done anything to its right child, but instead of connecting to this one, 
we want to connect to this node here because now it's 2 plus 1 so 2 plus 1 is 3 now in this case let's suppose you wanted to know the state of the segment tree after the first query and you've already done the second query well you can just ignore this node and just go back to this node right because we haven't modified anything before our current query we just added notes so that means that we can just jump back to any point in history whenever we want and you can keep doing this right now let's analyze uh, oh, hang on no, any questions are we all good is my explanation just so brilliant that you guys don't have any questions Uh, well, okay, the way I like to implement it is that you kind of have like a segment tree struct that like stores oh, where its left child is, where its right child is, and then its value. So this left child and right child, they can either be pointers or they can be indices to the array that you have all your nodes in, right? So th there are many ways. You could also use a vector if you just wanted to like continuously add nodes and so forth. So yeah, there are many ways of doing that part. Essentially, um, long story short, you just need a pointer seg tree, which is also what you need for a lazy create. But um, yeah. So now let's um, analyze the seg tree. Oh, hang on. Any more questions? No, we we all good. Cool. So let's analyze the seg tree. Okay, every time, this is in a point update, oh jeez, every time in a point update, how many nodes do we add? Well, we add this node, and then we add its parent, and then we add its parent, and so on, right? So clearly, this must be order log n nodes added, and therefore, it must also be order log n time complexity, because, um we added, we just continued adding notes. Okay, let's try some fancier stuff on this persistent segment tree. Let's suppose we wanted lazy propagation. Could we do that? Well, we totally could, because lazy propagation is just, you know, storing more, storing more information in each node, and we could totally do that. Same with range, um, same with range queries, right? As long as they visit order log n nodes, we will only create order log n nodes in this segment tree. So, Literally, any point or range update you can achieve in a normal seg tree, you can also achieve in a persistent seg tree. Which makes it incredibly versatile. So, now we know its properties and how to build one. How can we apply it to this problem here? Well, what we can do is we can build a persistent seg tree on this thing. So, let's take this sequence here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 2, 1, 3, 5. Right, and um, I'm not going to draw out the full tree. Um, I'm just assuming um, you guys can abstract this information because it would take a very long time. Okay, so this is the starting state. Oh, this is the starting state of our second tree. Right, all zeros here, and our first element that we want to add is a five. So. The five is at the end of this, um, the end of the array. So we add a one here, and then we set k equal to one, and then everything else here still stays as zero. So essentially, we're incrementing the value at this index. Then the next element is four, and it's at, and it's at this index. So we add a one here. Then we add the three here. Then we add the 3 here. Then we add the 2, and then the other 2, and then the 1, and then the other 1. Right. So it kind of looks, you know, a bit weird considering I'm not, I'm not drawing the zeros in. But um, this is an incredibly powerful way, powerful way to visualize a segment tree. Because, well, I don't have a rotation tool on here, but if you visualize it as a set of axes, you could consider these ones as points on a plane, right? And 
the segment tree, which is this thing, is kind of moving through towards this plane as you add points um, to the data structure. So yeah, that's kind of how this problem works. If if um, if you guys need a recap, so the way it works, first of all, you kind of find the order in which you should add elements for every k using a priority queue, and then you can use and then you can use segment tree walking to find the value you want. And then, oh geez, I'm just right, segment tree walking. So, oh, I don't know what happened there. Um, so, what we can do now is ignore this entire section and just process the queries online. And that can prove to be incredibly powerful for some tasks in which you can only do it online and you can't do it offline. So, um, yeah, oh no, this, um, when I was talking about lazy propagation, I wasn't talking about, um, I wasn't talking about this problem here. This problem just the segment tree for this problem is just point increment and range count, range sum query. So yes, this is how this problem works. All right, any any final questions? No, are we good? Nope. All right, that was that was very successful. That was that was amazing. That was amazing, guys. I hope you liked my um. I hope you liked my lecture. Yeah, it's the first time I prepared something as well. All right.